and welcome back to AGXM. With all the uncertainty that's going on in the world right now, we're asking experts in different countries how they think the state of the economy is in their own backyards and across the globe. Today we welcome Bennett Hunter, Canadian-based host of the popular YouTube channel Canadian Libertarian. But first, if this is your first time joining us, please go ahead and subscribe to our channel as well as check out agxpay.com to learn how the power of modern silver money can help you claim financial freedom. And now to our interview. Bennett, thank you for joining us. Not a problem at all, Nick. I'm really excited to hear, be here on this show with you and discussing the topic that uh, you're, the folks that you deal with reached out to me about because this is something that I think is very important, especially in 2020 in this modern digital era. So for those members of our audience who are either not familiar with you or not Canadian, give us a bit about your background. Why did you start your YouTube channel and what is the core messaging that you're trying to share on your platform? Okay, uh, well, the big thing for me, and I'll just try to summarize it pretty quickly, but uh, growing up, I was disenfranchised, not just through the economic system, but the legal system and a lot of the, the structures in terms of governance and corporations and stuff. And, and I noticed that there was a lot of things that were, power was just far too centralized in so many areas in so many ways. And, and it has caused not just social harm to a lot of people, but a lot of economic harm. harm. And I've had to go through my own uh, uh, circumstances economically and socially as a consequence of that. So I started to try to look for answers. And then, you know, being someone that's been on the internet for most of my life, I'm, I basically, my first computer was a Commodore VIC-20 in 1985. <laughs> so I've been on the internet for a long time. And I wanted to see what's, what's some answers because it's, it's basically the internet I noticed was a lot of people with ideas and uh, very innovative and creative people. That's kind of where I wanted to uh, look to. And that led me along the lines of people talking about libertarianism. I heard about Ron Paul when he was running for uh, uh, president down in the United States, 2008, 2012. He talked a lot about end the Fed, which got you, gets me thinking, gets people. When you hear those things said, it's like, what are you, Fed, what are you talking about? Central banks, this, it kind of starts you down that road of monetary policy. And, you know, once you've started down that rabbit hole, so to speak, and you start to learn a little bit more of the nuance of what money today is actually deemed money, what they try to perceive or, or, or suggest as money these days is it's kind of far removed from what money actually is supposed to be. So that, like I say, that's kind of what led me down that rabbit hole and got me, you know, obviously now with uh, cryptocurrencies such as block, uh, Bitcoin, your and now with the initiatives such as yours, as this is the kind of thing that I'm saying is, is there's disruptors in the social media sphere. There's a lot of disruptors in the digital realm that's, uh, you know, helping us to be able to shift to a new paradigm and money, which is a representation of our value, basically on your intellect, on your labor and the things that you provide, all the, the goods and services. That is something that is a major disruptor that I think is going to be very important going forward. So this is actually something that I'm really interested in. Great. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that. What is it about our economy that is so off kilter for you? Right. Well, the problem, of course, I mean, you kind of got to go back. There's been multiple steps along the way. But like I say, to try to keep, to keep this kind of short is basically the, the last vestige of anything that restricted or tied to um, central planner types, those in government, was, you know, the severance of the gold standard. When Nixon completely severed entirely, where there was no way, there was nothing to tangibly, no tangible commodity to restrict the kind of fiat currencies that we all function under. So in Canada, we use the Canadian dollar, and you know, Americans use the American dollar, and they're all traded based on, you know, their, their valuations. But because central banks now are basically working in unison these days, especially subsequent to the financial crash, is there's no way for to seek a safe, safe haven in one particular country because they just constantly devalue almost, that's why they have those G20 and those G7, G8 meetings. So they're constantly devaluing our cur currencies, which is, you know, destroying our purchasing power. So you go out there and you make a hundred bucks today, it's going to be worth less tomorrow, which is destroying, like I say, all that productivity, all that value that you've created. And that's just for one person using $100 bill as an example. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's how do you get out from underneath that kind of centralization? Because that's the thing when the government controls or central banks, which is a central bank is just an act of legislation. So the government basically controls the currency. Then there's no way for a typical person to restore or retain that, that value that you've built up through your productivity, through your labor, through your intellect. And to me, that's what we've got to help to shift away from so that we can retain those values. Oh, absolutely. You've uh, touched on this a little bit with cryptocurrencies, but what alternatives to fiat are presently out there for people? Because as we've just discussed, fiat currencies are effectively worthless. 
Right. Well, to me, as with, and, and, and most of us that understand anything that has to do with real money, as you folks probably <laughs> obviously do, is it has to be, first of all, it has to be some kind of intrinsic value. It has to be a medium or a measure of that value. It has to be a medium of exchange of that value. And it has to be a method that you can retain that value for future use. Now, historically, gold and silver, because of all the elements, those two elements seem to be the ones that were most conducive that met those requirements to be considered sound money. So it, it has intrinsic value regardless. You know, silver is used in a multitude of ways. So it already has inherent intrinsic value, just like gold. And because it's, it's a medium to exchange that value and it has, has a, a lot of historical precedent in terms of trying to allocate that kind of value. And once again, you can retain that value. Even if you if it burnt in your house, even if you had gold or silver stored in your house, it's still going to be there. It might not be in the original shape, but it's still <laughs> going to be there and it's still going to retain that value. So to me, those are the things. And of course, there's other externalities as well in, in terms of commodities, something that has, like I said, that meets those four requirements is what I would deem actual money. So let's do a comparison here, uh, one that often comes up actually. If Bitcoin, for example, is a great technology, but it has no inherent value. So then, in your opinion, are traditional assets like gold and silver better assets in this sense when compared to Bitcoin? Well, here's the thing. Now, I'm not nearly as proficient in my knowledge. and I'm hopefully going to you know, adopt and, and get up to speed better when it comes to some of these cryptocurrencies. Because I'm obviously a, a late adopter. I wish I had gotten a little, little earlier. But as you suggest, some of these cryptocurrencies... You know, they are still kind of speculative in terms of their, their ability to retain or maintain any kind of value at this particular time. But one thing I, that st stood out to me in terms of cryptocurrencies, because they're built on the blockchain technologies, is the fact that there has to be proof of work. And so it's kind of like a form of mining, just like if you were going to mine for silver or gold in the physical world, you'd have to do that with, with actual putting in real work, real effort, right? With mm -hmm. some of your labor. So one thing I've noticed about the cryptocurrencies in, in terms of your theme or, or Bitcoin is there has to be proof of work to have any semblance of actual value. And of course, because it's distributed on, on the ledger and people have to be able to prove that that work was actually done. It does kind of in a, in a, in, in somewhat of a way, give you some kind of a representation of value. But what I, what I think about these things automatically, and which is why I'm interested in talking to you today is, let's say the power goes down tomorrow or, or something happens that might affect. Uh, I've also heard that these cryptocurrencies actually can be somewhat manipulated, although the, the expenditure required to get to the point where you have 50 plus 1% of it, it would be, you'd, you'd be spending more to manipulate the algorithms. So it really wouldn't make it worth it. But once again, to me, uh, tying something like silver, which is what you folks are trying to do mm -hmm. with your uh, uh, cryptocurrency that you're inventing or you already got, is you're tying it with an actual tangible commodity. And to me, that's, that's something that no matter if it's done through electronic means, which makes that exchange so much simpler in real time at the speed of light, that's great. But I also want redundancy built in to maintain that value in case I need it you know, in the real physical world as well, right? Yeah, we like to think of it as taking an old standard that we know has stood the test of time and marrying it to bleeding edge technology that gives us the confidence and the ability to operate in a decentralized way where we're not dependent on a global government to validate that this is a legitimate thing. And we're actually very glad that you're supportive of the project. Now, we speak to many financial experts on the show and many of them are saying that the global situation we're in right now is the catalyst for the next Great Depression. What are your thoughts on this? Well, this is the problem. And I know there's a lot of people that I respect tremendously, even people, people such as, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Peter Schiff. Uh, he, he's a real great, he's a smart guy. And uh, you know, he's, he's usually plays the role of the bear. And he was actually one of those, those guys that were out in front uh, during just prior to the crash, basically warning about the potential dangers and hazards. Now, luck of the draw, because I would, because basically what I would say is because it's, it's too much of an imperfect system to be able to control and manipulate things entirely. You know, he, he did get uh, his uh, predictions correct. Uh, that, the writing was on the raw, wall already. But what I fear the most is it's almost impossible now, especially subsequent to the economic crash, the financial crisis of 2008, it's almost impossible to create any scenarios because all of us that, that you know, are, are uh, students of economics, whether it's Austrian, classic, or even Keynesian, is 
all the modeling has been completely broken. So there is literally no way to make predictions at this point in time because central banks, well, I mean, look, look what happened already. The Federal Reserve now, it's QE4 already, right? So we're now into the fourth round of quantitative easing where they've now added one half and they added another 500 million. So you're over two, I think it's almost two and a half trillion dollars now that they've added into, uh, into the system. But because they can move that money around to particular jurisdictions, if you had done that, you know, with the with the gold standard still in place, I mean, you would see, you would be experiencing hyperinflation, right? Because there'd be no way to hide that kind of stuff. But because there's ways to manipulate the system, and they've done it, they've almost perfected their their ability to manipulate the system and the money supply in so many ways. It's hard to predict what's going to happen. I mean, there are there's definitely. I do feel. I think we all kind of have this sixth sense that 2020 seems to be one of those times where. It might be all about you know the movers and shakers changing up the incentive structure because incentive structure to me is the big big thing that's going to it's going to get people you know the, re the reason why people were savers in the past is because you could actually save by having actual um, interest rates that would make that possible. You can't save money now. You, if you get a half a percentage of interest rate, but meanwhile inflation is way outstripping that, you're actually losing money hand over fist. That's happening in the bond market, right? We're seeing the stock market going down. But if the stock market goes down, well, if the Fed prints a bunch of money, hands that money off to these banksters and they reinvest and recapitalize the market, well, you can keep this scheme. Like I say, because not everyone is astute enough to understand proper macroeconomics or market economics, then they might be able to get away with this stuff for a long time going further, which is why the education and having alternatives to test out, which is some of these cryptocurrencies or what you folks are coming up with, is to have a hedge against the potential. That to me is the most important thing. Very well said, Bennett. That's all we have for today's questions. Do you have any closing words for our audience? Yeah, actually I do. And uh, it kind of goes back a little bit to how I started talking about at the beginning of this conversation, how I, I got into computers in, in a very early age. Actually, there's a girlfriend I had at the time in my teen years. Her younger brother was actually the one that was in computers and he kind of turned me on to it, trying to be like the, the nice boyfriend to the younger brother. But I'm very appreciative that he did because it's been very important for me along the course of my life. And because of all the younger people today in particular, in particular, especially like the, the millennials and the Gen Zers, is I want them and those who, who watch this show, or even if you're older, it doesn't matter actually, but like I say, the, the children or the young are the future. But if people could take advantage, because most people, because it's something that they're so used to and accustomed to, like I grew up in it, but I understood when I grew up, there was a time when there was no computer and then there was. So the young people have become so accustomed to living in the digital realm and the computer realm I think they're taking advantage of the fact, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not against people sharing pictures of their cat. I'm not against people, you know, just selfies, right? But the fact that you basically have the breadth of almost the history of, of human knowledge at your fingertips, if I could give people one piece of advice is take full advantage of the fact that you live in this modern age of information where everything basically is at your fingertips. Now you got to be able to navigate because there's some bad information as well, but it's there. It's there for the taking. So I would suggest and recommend to anyone is take advantage of that and get your knowledge up to speed because in this modern age in particular, knowledge is power. That's all we have for today's interview with Bennett Hunter. So glad that you guys could join us. And as always, if this is your first time, please go ahead and subscribe to our channel and check out agxpay.com to learn how the power of modern silver money can help you claim financial freedom. Take care.